the reason that people with ADHD and autism struggle is because they're in the minority. I think if they had been in the majority, it would be the rest of the neurotypical ones of us who would struggle because right. the environment would be adapted for them. I'm Adam Hunt, and this is the Evolving Psychiatry Podcast, rethinking mental health through an evolutionary lens. Share it with the people who matter, like it if you like it, subscribe if you want to hear more. Dr. Anis Swanepoel is a child and adolescent psychiatrist who also holds a PhD in human physiology. She is the author and co-author of many articles in evolutionary psychiatry uh, and became interested in evolutionary science learning about attachment theory. She's currently the editor of the EPSIC newsletter and today we're talking about chapter 15 in the Cambridge University Press volume on evolutionary psychiatry. It's titled Evolutionary Perspectives on Neurodevelopmental Disorders. Uh, a very interesting topic that affects a lot of people, also something I sort of work in a little bit. Um, so, so to kick off, Annie, you mentioned mismatch is a very important consideration in understanding neurodevelopmental disorders, especially ADHD. Um, so could you talk a little bit about mismatch and ADHD? Yes, gladly. So just to explain mismatch a bit more, I think before I mention ADHD, a very simple um, example is that around obesity. So if we think about our evolutionary past, um, it was very difficult to get hold of lots of calories, particularly lots of fat and sugar. And we have all evolved to seek it out because it was more dangerous to die in, uh, of a famine than to become obese. And that is what we have adapted to. And now in our modern environment, it is completely different to the environment we adapted to in that high calorie, fatty and sweet um, food is common and, and cheaply available. And because of this mismatch, it now leads to widespread obesity. So I just wanted to, to explain that first as an example of an evolutionary mismatch, because I think ADHD is very similar. So people with ADHD have got um, high hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention. But we could think about it as in the past, it was really important that some of the people in the group would have lots of energy, might be more inclined to take risks, and might be more easily distracted by a rustle in the bushes, which might mean that there's a predator coming. So you can see how in our evolutionary past, these, what we now consider to be pathological symptoms, might have not only been, been helpful, but might have been especially useful. Mm -hmm. And it is only because we now expect children to sit still for five hours a day, 200 right. days a year, yes. and to pay attention, God. which is definitely not anything we were prepared for uh, yeah. through, evolution, through evolution. It's almost and a bigger mismatch than food. Anyway. Yeah, so, so looking yeah. at that um, and saying these there's something wrong with these children, I think is missing the point because right. perhaps there's something wrong with, with the schools <laughs> and what we're expecting children to do. Right, absolutely. Yeah, and I'm sure that will, that will ring true to a lot of people with ADHD because they often report that, you know, they're very good at some things and they just they just find it really hard to to concentrate and look straight up at a board. And yeah, I mean, it's it's really bizarre what we put people, <laughs> we put children through um, and then to, to diagnose them and, and claim that it's a disorder is you know, a very strange situation. Um, so you also mentioned autism spectrum disorder. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the complexity of the autism spectrum? Um, and also how, how an evolutionary approach might help us understand um, autism in general. Yeah, so autism we know is on a spectrum. Um, so there are people who are highly functioning, who might be professors in, in their chosen subject uh, mm -hmm. with autism, and then also people with severe learning disability who might have autism. So I think they're Looking at it from an evolutionary perspective, we can see that some bits of it, particularly those that are linked with intellectual disability, are a disorder and are often caused by genetic uh, problems, whereas the high functioning end is probably more around neurodiversity, and that is where some people 
and we are all on, a, on, on the spectrum, but some people are just more inclined to be particularly good with um, numbers or um, thinking about spatial, uh, spatial orientation. Yeah. Yeah. Systemizing is the term. That, yeah. exactly. And might be a bit, struggle a bit more with the social and emotional communication. Right. But if we think about the uh, prevalence of autism, it's around 1%. And that would mean that in a typical hunter-gatherer group, there might have been one or two uh, on, with high-functioning autism. Mm -hmm. And that might have been of benefit for the whole group, because if you have somebody who, who can really persist uh, with making tools and optimizing how to make the tools or, or um, planning out how the hunt might work, that could be of benefit uh, to the whole group. Mm. And that still is the case today. So we know that many, many of our best uh, inventions and progress in, right. in human life has been pushed forward by people um, who are higher functioning autistic. Right. So again, there, it's not really, in my mind, it's, it's not a disorder. And it's, I think it's wrong to call it a disorder. Mm -hmm. I think it is a, a diverse a neurodiversity mm -hmm. and being on a spectrum and a variation. Uh, that is the way we should look at it. Right. You have these strengths and weaknesses, which are sort of bouncing out. And we just happen to be diagnosing some of them as as disorders because we see these weaknesses like you know the adhd individuals have this weakness and that they can't sit still um but then they probably have these other strengths but we're just not seeing them and and yeah autism is a great example you know elon musk the richest man in the world is autistic so clearly something's going on there that's not um yeah it's not as simple as saying this is a disorder clearly um right absolutely i so so what do you think this perspective means in terms of affecting our treatment you do mention quite a lot in your chapter about you know um how a specific treatment plan might be altered by kind of an evolutionary perspective or how you might how you might think about helping a child with autism or ADHD um, if you're evolution informed um, so you talk could you talk a little bit about that well I think I think the main thing um, the main insight I gained as a child psychiatrist was that it's about the goodness of fit between the child and the environment mm. so you know that people are very often when you talk about evolution and they'll think it's survival of the fittest. Right. But what it really means is that those who fit best in their environment have the best chance of survival and, and reproduction. So it's, it's not just about adapting the individual, it's also about adapting the environment. And that I think is absolutely crucial because I have seen so many examples of that in clinical practice. So for example, one teacher uh, didn't have any problems with a child with ADHD because she was just extremely good at recognizing when he needed a break and then sent him with a big pile of books to the other side of the school. Um, and then but when they came back, he was able to sit still and concentrate again. So we have got in the UK, we've got the Equality Act, which actually um, says that reasonable adjustments have to be made. And I think that is something which we need to, as a society, consider a lot more because the reason that people with ADHD and autism struggle is because they're in the minority. I think if they had been in the majority, it would be the rest of the neurotypical ones of us who would struggle because right. the environment would be adapted for them. Right. And, and I think that is something we really need to consider. So nowadays, when I see a child with ADHD or autism, I, I don't focus just this is the child this is their diagnosis this is the treatment i very much try to look at their environment and try and see how we can adapt the environment so that they fit better into their environment that there's more understanding for them children with adhd for example that they can have a lot more exercise mm -hmm. uh, children with autism that they can that people can understand that they have other needs than neurotypical people I've spoken to so many mothers um, of boys with autism who are worried sick because their boys are just sitting in their rooms and, and playing on the computer and they want them to be social. And where I say to them, well, you know, perhaps as long as your son is happy, 
um, that is what, what they need. If you were to push them out to be social all the time, it might be extremely stressful for them and not conducive to their good mental health. So right. it's, it's very much thinking about the goodness of it. Right, and that you're not trying to push everyone into a single box and make everyone into a this one kind of cookie cutter shape of human who who everyone should try and fit within and instead try and find individual strengths and weaknesses no, because, and, because life is so variable we need lots of different types of people and that is right. why neurodiversity is so important because people with autism definitely can outperform outperform neurotypicals because right. they they've got their special interest and they can stick with it for far longer than somebody without autism could. Mm. And that is why I think they can excel uh, given the, their correct niche. And similarly, people with ADHD can do particularly well in situations where uh, they le- uh, need to be very active and where they get very little sleep. Um, mm. So, so we, need, we need those people and we need to, to um, help Harness. them thrive. Harness and help, yeah. I know that uh, Elon has said that the thing that he thought gave him an advantage is just that he did obsess about, you know, building software and building companies. And he was just, he was just spending way more time doing these things. And in the end, if you channel that in a way that's productive, then, you know, that's a very, it's a very useful way to be successful in the modern world. Um, it's just mm-hmm. if, in those initial 15 years where you're going through a school system and parents are trying to make you normal, then uh, yeah, mm-hmm. it's obviously not, not ideal. No, it's, uh, it's very interesting in terms of uh, ADHD as well, because very many entrepreneurs have ADHD right. because they can, um, they're much more willing to take risks. You know, neurotypical people are saying, oh, it might not work. I'd rather not do it. <laughs> but yeah. somebody with ADHD says, well, let's go for it and see. And then right. put in loads of energy. And, and these are the people who, who really make a big difference to the world. But yes, I always say to my patients with neurodevelopmental uh, disorders, I, I always say to them that life will become easier the older you get, right. because then you can find your niche and you can excel. That's a wonderful uh, message and yeah, I completely agree. Thank you so much for, for talking about your chapter. It's a really, it's really great and really great insight. Thank you so much. Annie. Thank you. Andy.